before we begin the presentation, I'd like to read our Leeward Community College Ooia Aina Land Acknowledgement Statement uh, to recognize the Aina we occupy and its relationship to the Kanaka Ui, its steward. Leeward Community College, with profound reflection, offers this Ooia Aina Land Acknowledgement Statement, recognizing Hawaii as an indigenous space whose original people are today identified as Native Hawaiian. Leeward Community College upholds the University of Hawaii's commitment to the well-being of our indigenous communities. This Ho'oia Aina honors the relationship between Kanaka Oibi and the land upon which the college sits. With much aloha, this statement pays respect to the Aina Oibi of our Pu'uloa campus and Waianae Moku Education Center, both located on the Mokupuni of Oahu, Moku of Eba, Ahupua'a of Waiawa, as well as the Moku of Waianae and the Ahupua'a of Lualuale. This Ho'oia Aina welcomes all who gather on these ancestral lands. Welcome to Leeward Community College. Thank you. Today's presentation is part of Leeward Community College's Weeks of Remembrance programming to commemorate and reflect on the Nike incarceration and implications for our civil rights and civil liberties today. The events include book club, book club discussions of Julie Otsuka's award-winning novel, When the Emperor Was Divine, an exhibit in our Learning Commons display case, as well as today's presentation by Gerald Takesono and Michael Oishi. Our Weeks of Remembrance events are all the more relevant to our Leeward community as Hawaii's largest concentration camp, Ono Uli Uli, lies in our service area, only five miles from where we stand today between Waipahu and Matapito. However, none of the programming for our Weeks of Remembrance would have been possible without the support of Sharon Arimatsu and her generous faculty development award which provided the funds for these events. Um, and for that, we would like to recognize Sharon before the presentation. So I want to read a little bit about <laughs> Sharon grew up in Kualapu'u, a Del Monte pineapple plantation of only 300 people on the island of Molokai. At the age of 13, going on 14, her parents sent her to a boarding school at Mid Pacific Institute on Oahu where she graduated with honors in 1962. After graduating with honors from the University of Hawaii in 1967 with a degree in history, Karen spent four years as a researcher with the, state of, uh, with the state's House of Representatives under Speaker Tadao Bethu, which piqued her subsequent lifetime interest in politics and issues of fairness and justice. From 1981 to 1984, in the cabinet of Honolulu Mayor Eileen Anderson, Sharon served as director of the Office of Information and Complaint. Sharon has also held several posts in the University of Hawaii Community College system, including a stint as the provost for the Ward Community College from 1998 to 2000, during which time she established a reputation as an innovator and an ardent supporter of the college. From 2000 to 2002, Sharon served as the Deputy Director of the Department of Business, Economic Development, and Tourism under Governor Ben Cayetano. And in 2004, she became the first woman to lead the Honolulu Japanese Chamber of Commerce after over 100 years of male leadership. Her interest in women's rights spurred her in the early 1980s to establish, along with a woman friend, the Organization of Women Leaders, OWL. When women were not allowed to become members of Rotaries, Elves, Lions, Kiwanis, and all the country clubs in Hawaii. OWL is still an active organization today, nearly 40, 40 years later. To help women break through the glass ceiling, Sharon has also become the first female president of the East Honolulu Rotary Club in the early 1990s after the U.S. Supreme Court ruled in 1987 that Rotary and other clubs could no longer discriminate against women. In retirement, Sharon continues to fight for women's rights, to travel, particularly to Europe, 
and to support Leeward Community College through her generous faculty and staff development awards. For all that you've done and for all that you continue to do for the Leeward, commun for Leeward Community College and the community, we want to thank you, Shannon. Everything that you do and all of the continued support. Thank you. you are a lot of creativity at the All right, now I have the privilege of introducing our speakers for today's presentation. And I'm going to start by introducing Jerry or Saturu Takesono was born on December 20, 1944, in the Tule Lake Relocation Center. Following his graduation from Mid-Pacific Institute in 1962, he obtained a bachelor's in zoology uh, from the University of Kansas in 1966, and a DDS from Northwestern University in 1970. Following dental school, Jerry served in the United States Air Force, during which time he was stationed in Thailand, and then Hickam Air Force Base. After his military service concluded in 1974, Jerry opened his own private practice until he retired in, in mid-2013. Jerry's interest in the study of the Japanese-American incarceration is an effort to learn more about his family and their experience. Welcome, Jerry. Thank you. Oh, <laughs> And now <clears throat> I'm going to come up first to speak. I would like to introduce uh, Michael Oishi. Michael is an associate professor of literature in the Arts and Humanities Division here at Leeward Community College. He is also the 2022 recipient of the Sharon Mary Master Faculty Development Award. Michael was also a participant in a week long National Endowment for the Humanities, Landmarks of American History and Culture teacher training workshop on the Nikkei incarceration at the Japanese American National Museum in Los Angeles this last year. Welcome, Michael. Thank you. Okay, so thank you, Carlos, for reading our whole Ia Aina land, land acknowledgement statement and for doing the introductions. Um, I don't trust myself to go ad lib or to improvise. Jerry's going to be doing that. Um, but I know that there are some historians here today, so I don't want to get anything wrong. So I'm going to be, so please forgive me if you see the top of my head more than my face. Okay? Um, before Jerry and I begin, I'd like to acknowledge some individuals and groups that uh, made this presentation possible. Um, and also to note some of the other events that comprise our Weeks of Remembrance. So first, I want to thank Sharon Narimatsu for her generous faculty development award that helped support this project. Sharon also put me in touch with Jerry, and so put me in touch with a living part of the experiences we'll be talking about today. Uh, I would also like to thank the Innovation Center for Teaching and Learning, and particularly uh, Aaron Thompson for supporting this project and providing key guidance during its completion. Um, I would also like to thank the staff of uh, the Leeward CC Library for making available the Kapunawai Room as well as the display case for a Weeks of Remembrance programming. So if you haven't had an opportunity to see it, um, maybe on the way either out, um, you can see there's a display case in our learning commons. So it has a number of uh, images and documents in there. And some of them are from Jerry's family. Um, in particular, I would like to acknowledge Anne-Marie Paikai for allowing us use of the Kapunawai Room and what a fitting place it is for today's presentation. And I especially want to acknowledge Anne Hollowell, who was an immense help in put, helping me put together the exhibit near the circulation desk. And, uh, she, and thank her for also putting up with all of my neuroticism in the last few weeks <laughs> to try to get the display together. Um, regarding the, 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 present, uh, the exhibit out front in the learning comments, so it's a modest present uh, exhibit. Um, it's not the Smithsonian. Um, it's not the Japanese American National Museum, but please be understanding of our limited resources. But I would also like to acknowledge Jerry Takesono, so my co-presenter for today, for sharing some of his and his family's photographs, documents, and experiences with all of us via our exhibit and presentation today. Okay, so, okay, so we have some slides. I think before we begin, we'd like to provide some kind of glosses for terms that we'll be using throughout this presentation. Um, 
On February 19, 1942, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt signed Executive Order 9066, the presidential directive that effectively authorized the forced removal of 125,321 individuals of Japanese ancestry. It has been a little over 81 years since that fateful day, and yet, surveying our current political, social, and cultural landscape, it seems that the lessons of those dark days have either been forgotten or learned only superficially. It is in that spirit that today's presentation is titled, The Past Isn't Even Past, which is adapted from a quotation by the Southern writer, William Faulkner, who claimed that the past isn't dead, it isn't even past, in regard to the South's relationship to the Civil War. So as we hope to discuss in this presentation, recent and current events seem to make the incarceration an, uh, an important and even necessary part of our public discourse in order to protect and expand our civil rights and civil liberties. So following the prescient words of George Santayana, those who cannot learn from history are doomed to repeat it. Those who do not remember their past are condemned to repeat their mistakes. So that said, the goal of this presentation is that it moves us in some small but meaningful way to learn from and to avoid repeating the worst of our history. So a couple of terms that I'd like to begin with is uh, the term Nikkei. So not everybody is familiar with this term. Um, but it's a general term to refer to individuals of Japanese descent, so regardless of nationality. So it's just an easier, more economical term than rather than saying Japanese and Japanese American. Uh, the reason being is that the first generation, so that's actually related to the second term, which is Issei. So the Issei are the first or immigrant generation of Japanese to the US. And most were prevented from naturalizing as US citizens, citizens excuse me, by the 1924 Immigration Exclusion Act. So technically, the Issei were not Americans. So having to say Japanese and Japanese Americans is a little cumbersome. So Nikkei is just a general generic word for anybody of Japanese descent. Uh, another term that we'll be using quite a bit is Nisei. So that's the second generation of Japanese in the United States. Uh, most were born in the US and were thus American citizens at the time of the incarceration. We may not get to this last term. It depends on where our discussion takes us. It's not part of the formal presentation. But uh, another term is sansei. So that's the third generation of Japanese in the US. Many were either children during the incarceration or did not experience the camps at all. Uh, many came of age in the 1960s during the civil rights and anti-war movements. And many of them had a different set of experiences relative to the incarceration. And one of the things that we'll be talking about today as we kind of get deeper into the discussion um, is that people's understandings, interpretations, experiences of the incarceration differ markedly by generation. Right. OK, so a kind of quick summary of the incarceration I think is going to be useful for us. So um, what was it? So the US government forcibly removed 125,321. So that's a much more specific number than we've had in the past. Uh, recently, you may have seen on NBC News that they've done, uh, via the Irecho project um, uh, at JANUM, which is the Japanese American National Museum, they've uh, been involved with a very kind of detailed count. A lot of it had to do with the methodology. I think we all knew how many uh, incarcerees there were. But it's about the methodology of counting uh, that's been kind of consistent now. Uh, there were 125,321 Nikkei. And any non-Nikkei family members who were voluntarily submitted to uh, removal uh, to 75 identified our incarceration sites. Um, and I say any non-Nikkei family members, because there were about a dozen um, non-Japanese who were incarcerated too. They willingly went. And so one of the famous ones, um, uh, was a painter, um, Estelle Ishigo. Her name, if her uh, maiden name was Peck, so Estelle Peck Ishigo. She was a white woman who married a Japanese man uh, named Arthur Ishigo. Uh, and she voluntarily went into the camps because she did not want to be separated from her husband. Um, and she was a famous watercolorist. And you can sometimes see some of her images uh, in different museums around the country. Uh, following the attack on Pearl Harbor, the incarceration was ostensibly motivated by a fear that Nikkei in the US would engage in treason and sabotage to support Japan in its, in, in its imperial wartime efforts. So uh, it was also authorized by, as I kind of noted earlier, by um, 
Fr President Franklin Delano Roosevelt, uh, FDR, through Executive Order 9066 on February 19, 1942. Uh, so that's what's generally uh, recognized as the Day of Remembrance for Japanese Americans. And it was enforced by Public Law 503. So Public Law 503 was actually the law that actually gave teeth to Executive Order 9066. 9066 was basically a kind of um, policy that allowed military uh, commanders to designate exclusion zones. So, and I'll talk more about that a little, a little later. Um, and there was removal to assembly centers that began in March 1942, and the last permanent concentration camp closed in March 1946, and that was Thule Lake, where Jerry's family uh, was located. Um, I have some additional slides on this uh, topic. So nearly two-thirds of those incarcerated were born in the United States and were American citizens by birth. So the average age of Issei during the incarceration was 60, and the average age of Nisei was 18. So there's quite a bit of difference between the average ages of those two groups. Um, and that's going to also play a great effect about how people interpreted the incarceration as well. So most of Hawaii's Nikkei population, that was nearly 150,000, were not incarcerated. However, approximately 1,200 to 1,800 Nikkei from Hawaii were forcibly removed to det detention facilities in Hawaii and also on the continental U.S. So some of them were actually shipped to the, uh, the continental U.S., the mainland. So in 1980, the Commission on Wartime Relocation and Internment of Civilians determined that the incarceration of Nikkei was the result of, quote, race prejudice, war hysteria, and a failure of political leadership. So this resulted in the Civil Liberties Act of 1988, which provided a public apology signed by President Ronald Reagan and reparation payments of 20,000 for surviving Nikkei who were incarcerated. Okay. Uh, if you were in utero at the time of the camps and not yet born, you did not get $20,000. So the seas, I think what's important to understand is that the seas of the Nikkei incarceration were sown much earlier than the bombing of Pearl Harbor on December 7, 1941. Um, that's the usual point that people point to, but I don't think that it's the correct or accurate genesis point to look at. So following the passage of the Chinese Exclusion Act in 1882, which banned the immigration of Chinese laborers to the U.S. for 10 years, and which was made permanent in 1902, the U.S. was forced to look to countries other than China for sources of inexpensive labor. So Japan became the next major source of cheap Asian labor in the late 19th century due to its precarious economic condition, the result of the country's movement from a feudal to an industrial economy. Most Issei came to the U.S. as contract laborers to work on Hawaii's plantations. Most were young adult males with limited means from Japan's agricultural class. Most, uh, many subsequently immigrated to the continental U.S. As occurred with the Chinese, Japanese immigrants often became scapegoats for high unemployment, low wages, and perceived declines in American social and cultural institutions. The perception of Asians as threats to life and liberty in the West is generally known as the yellow peril. In fact, I have an image of that here. Um, in the case of uh, Takao Ozawa v. United States 1922, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that Japanese immigrants to the U.S., like the Chinese immigrants before them, were ineligible for naturalization as U.S. citizens. So this prevented Issei from becoming American citizens. So, one of the things I understand is that the Chinese Exclusion Act, that the fates of all the Asian groups are really tied together, right? So what happened with the Chinese also kind of bled over into understanding what happened to the Japanese as well. So the same kind of stereotyping, and here you have this image, the yellow terror, uh, terror in all its glory, which appeared in 1899. Um, you can see here, um, it's a Chinese coolie, and you can tell it's Chinese by way of the, the queue in the back. And so this was the fear that, that Chinese immigrants would bring just death and destruction on the United States if allowed in, or just anywhere in the West, really. So you can see that he has a gun in one hand, he has a knife in his teeth, um, and he, he looks to have killed a white woman. Right? And this was the fear that was going, uh, of what would happen with unbridled immigration. Let me move to this next image. So this is from actually Hollywood, California in 1923. So a lot of that anti-Asian sentiment and became anti-Japanese sentiment. Um, and we'll talk more about this later, but there was a lot of economic competition during the time, especially as Japanese became very successful uh, farmers 
and fishermen. So this, great, this sentiment that built up over time uh, was, in some ways, a, a function of trying to get the Japanese out. Right? So they, they wouldn't be competition for businesses, fisher, uh, fisheries, uh, or for farmers. Right? So the alien land laws, which limited an, uh, land ownership to U US citizens, ensured that Asians could not own the land on which they resided. This prevented Issei from setting down legal and more permanent routes in the United States. This would further perceptions of Japanese as uninterested in participating in American cultural life and per, uh, perpetuated views of them as perpetual foreigners in the US. So it's a bit of a catch-22. You can't own land. You can't set down roots. And then they blame you for not making. And then there was also redlining. You couldn't, uh, Japanese or any other like people of color couldn't live anywhere they wanted. Right? They had to live in certain redlined districts. Um, and because of that, they were blamed for not wanting to assimilate to American culture. So, um, you can't win, no matter what you do. So of the Nisei who migrated to the mainland United States, most settled on the West Coast, primarily in California, so 70% by 1940, with most concentrated in and around Los Angeles. So one of the things to note, too, for when the concentration camps get set up, uh, depending on where you live was determined where you were sent. But the problem is that a place like LA was so large, uh, had so many Nikkei in the area, that there was no way that one camp or even a couple of camps could hold them all, so they were set, set off in different directions. Right? But generally, you can kind of predict where people would, would camp they would go to based on the homes that they lived in. So many Issei came from agricultural communities and thus possessed extensive knowledge of intensive cultivation, uh, including knowledge of soils, fertilizers, and land reclamation. So this enabled many Nisei to become successful farmers and business people. So this is an image of uh, Rohitsu Shibuya. So he was a successful Issei uh, chrysanthemum farmer in Mountain View, California. Um, this was uh, taken in April 18, 1942. So this is actually after um, the bombing or the attack on Pearl Harbor. Uh, and I'll talk about more about the images that I have in this slideshow. But note that this, is, uh, this photograph is by Dorothea Lange. It's a famous photographer during the era. Um, we have a lot of photos. There were lots of images from uh, during the incarceration because she was commissioned by the War Relocation Authority to take photographs, along with another famous photographer named Ansel Adams that probably a, a lot of you are familiar with. Um, Issei's success in agriculture and fishing eventually led to competition and conflicts with white farmers and fishermen on the West Coast, particularly in California. This competition would become a key motivation for the forced removal of Nikkei after the bombing of Pearl Harbor. So the antipathy of Asians in general and Japanese in particular is the origin point of the Nikkei incarceration. So of course, then we have December 7th, 1941. So we're going to skip over like a lot of history uh, just to make it uh, feasible in this short hour and a half that we have. Um, Less than 24 hours after the attack on Pearl Harbor, FBI and Army agents apprehended pre-designated Nikkei, so mostly Issei. So they already knew who they wanted to pick up by that point, because there was surveillance going on before the bombing of Pearl Harbor. Once it was determined that it looked like war was likely, FBI started to surveil uh, targets. The Issei detainees were local community members, Japanese language teachers, martial arts instructors, faith leaders, and business people. Most were men. The Department of Justice, or DOJ, and the Army would eventually keep in captivity more than 17,000 Nikkei in special camps, such as those in Crystal City, Texas, or Lordsburg, New Mexico. President Roosevelt signs Executive Order 9066 on February 19, 1942. Um, and that authorized, and I think it's important to be specific here, that authorized the Secretary of War and any military commander designated, de designated by him to, quote, prescribe military areas from which all persons may be excluded. So basically, it just carved out. It gave authority to military commanders that they can create uh, exclusion zones where they needed to. Right? So Executive Order EO-9066 does not mention Japanese by name. Okay, so that's important to understand. If you actually read the actual uh, executive order, there's no mention of Japanese at all in there. So members of the White House, State Department, military, and governors of several states vigorously debated the pros and cons of uh, the incarceration. So there was a lot of kind of 
anti-Japanese sentiment before the war, but then it really got going after the bombing of Pearl Harbor. So this is a famous image from Theodore Geisel uh, waiting for the signal from home. So most of you might be more familiar with Theodore Geisel's pen name, Dr. Seuss. Now, this isn't a one-off. He did several of these, in fact. Um, there's a Dr. Seuss archive um, at the UC San Diego where you can find these images that are in the public domain. So note here, too, um, you can tell that this is on the West Coast because you have Washington, Oregon, California. And these are all Japanese. And note how they look. They, they all look the same. Uh, they have glasses and buck teeth. Um, Notice that they're handing out this gentleman here, honorable fifth column, so fifth column meaning subversives within the United States, is passing out dynamite, TNT. Um, and it says waiting for the signal from home. It doesn't say where home is, but you can infer because he's looking across the ocean. If it's the coast, he's looking across the ocean to Japan. Right. And we have a similar uh, image here. Um, what have you done today to save your country from them? So Hitler and, I, I don't know, is that Hirohito, I guess, possibly, right? So there was a lot of kind of sentiment that was being dredged up at this time. Um, so when the incarceration, I think there's a misnomer. I think there's a misunderstanding that, that the incarceration was going to happen no matter what. There was actually a lot of vigorous debates over several weeks, actually several months, um, leading up to that. Francis Biddle, U.S. Attorney General, approved only the, the removal of non-citizens, so that means like the Issei, and only from proximities near to military installations. He opposed the, the indiscriminate incarceration of all West Coast Nikkei. So he said, if you're going to round people, anybody up, round, round up only the non-citizens, so the Issei, and make sure that they're the ones that are actually within or, or, uh, very sensitive um, national security areas, right? So around military bases or, na or uh, naval bases, right? John L. DeWitt, General of the Western Defense Command, advocated for the incarceration of all Nikkei on the West Coast, stating, quote, a Jap is a Jap. You can't tell one Jap from another. They all look the same. And John McCloy, Assistant Secretary of War, justified the incarceration of all Nikkei on the West Coast, saying, quote, if it is a question of the safety of the country and the Constitution, why the Constitution is just a scrap of paper to me. So today, there is a powerful speculation um, there, that uh, agricultural and business interests influenced President Roosevelt and Earl Warren, who was then Attorney General uh, for California, to opt for incarceration. So it's complicated, but there was a very powerful uh, economic lobbying group in California on behalf of um, farmers for, for agricultural interests. And at least a few critics have noted that it, it, they think that it's, uh, Roosevelt really needed the votes. He, need, he was coming up for re-election. So he really needed the votes of the California contingent. So in order to ensure that, he, helped, he basically catered to the, the lobbying groups from California, the agricultural interests. Right? and some of the fishing interests as well. And Earl Warren, at the time, he was attorney general, um, but he had his eyes set on the governorship. So there was that speculation. We don't know for a fact. It's never, there's not a paper trail that indicates that that was what, what they were thinking. OK, so within weeks of the president's signing of Executive Order 9066, public notices appeared notifying Nikkei that they would need to dispose of their property and belongings and prepare for an indefinite leave. So some Nikkei were given a, a few weeks' notice to prepare. Others had only two to three days. So approximately 5,000 Nikkei managed to move east of the exclusion zone, <coughs> i.e. east of the military area one. However, many were discouraged or actively prevented from doing so as gas stations and stores would not sell supplies to Nikkei. In some instances, bands of armed white men prevented Nikkei from traveling along uh, roads leading east. So you can see here the exclusion zone. This is kind of going down from about the middle of Washington, down the Oregon, down Oregon. So apparently, like down at least through Oregon, it follows the Columbia River. And I'm not sure this map is actually correct. Jerry and I were talking about this because Manzanar is still within Military Area 1. Military Area 1 is basically everything west of the, the big bold line there, right? So Military Area 2 was supposed to be everything east of that. Okay. But Manzanar is supposed to, I think the line is supposed to go like that. Okay. It does include the um, southern part of Arizona as well. 
this is from the um, San Francisco Examiner, April 1942. Um, that was kind of advocating for the ouster of Japanese and the forced removal of them. So the proclamation of military areas one and two further encouraged voluntary evacuation from uh, area one to inland states into area two. However, such voluntary, quote unquote, voluntary resettlement was not realistic for the ma vast majority of Nikkei. So recognizing this fact a month later, pro public proclamation number four was issued on March 27th, prohibiting Nikkei in area one from moving, which basically trapped Nikkei, they couldn't move, right? So at first you're saying, okay, as long as you get out of military area one, or get away from the coast, that's fine. And then you said, well, they, we can't move that fast. Like, oh, too bad. Then basically you come up with another public, public proclamation saying don't move at all. Uh, so they were trapped, basically. So Nikkei were allowed to bring with them only what they could carry. So generally limited to su two suitcases. So among the prohibited items were pets, radios, cameras, and anything that might be construed as a weapon, such as a baseball bat. So there's a famous anecdote of Norman Mineta, who was a former transportation secretary under uh, George W. Bush and uh, Barack Obama. Uh, he noted that he had wanted to bring his baseball glove, a baseball, um, baseball and a bat, but he was prevented from bringing the bat because uh, an officer told him that might be a weapon. He might use it as a weapon. And, and kill somebody. Okay. So this is uh, an example of a ex exclusive um, exclusion order 83. And you would see these signs. In fact, we have a replica of it in our display case. But this, these were pretty prominent uh, uh, throughout um, the West Coast at the time. OK, so at this point, Jerry is taking over. He's going to be talking about uh, some of the anecdotes. One of the things that ended up happening is that Due to the, uh, the removal order, uh, Japanese had to sell their things as fast as possible um, and then prepare for evacuation. So at this point, Jerry's taking over here. So unlike Mike, most of my stuff is, first of all, hearsay, but also things I've kind of researched. but. No, nothing formal, because the law doesn't really constrict me. He's, he's an academician, so he's got to be careful what he says. I don't have to be careful. But anyway, I want to add two terms, kotonk and burahe. Now, sometimes they're misconstrued as being uh, derogatory, discriminatory. But in Hawaii, we use it all the time, because it's heck of a lot easier to say kotonk versus Japanese American from the mainland. So I will use these th terms freely and not prejudicially. The other thing is that uh, many of the stories I heard from my friends and family, so I'm not, it's all hearsay. So I'm, I can't vouch for the validity I'm, because my mother embellished a lot, <laughs> made things nicer, cleaner, Camp was a nice thing that we had. You know, it was almost like fun. And to them, I, that's how they liked to view it. But that wasn't quite so. Now, specifically, um, my parents were in Hawaii when uh, <clears throat> the war broke out. Uh, my father was initially assigned to the Hilo Honganji. But in uh, December, I believe, no, before, before December 7th, he was transferred to Maui. So when the FBI came to arrest him, and he was in a category called C, Buddhist ministers and Shinto priests, that was the lowest of the three categories he had, A, B, and C. So they came looking for him. He wasn't in Hilo. They, they asked members, other people. They didn't know where he was. Or let's say they weren't telling where he was. He and my mother and my sister, who was born in September of 41, were now on Maui. So it wasn't until May, May 5th, that he, in 42, that he was finally arrested, put into the Maui uh, County Jail, and then transported to Sand Island, where he spent several months. And then from several, uh, after several months, he was transported to um, Angel Island in the San Francisco Bay, 
and then eventually to Lordsburg, New Mexico. So we didn't quite go through, or my parents didn't quite go through this. It wasn't, for them, it wasn't that drastic. But for the other people, they were told, you can take two bags with you, and that's it. These people had been living in the United States. The Issei had been living in the United States for years. The Nisei were younger, but they, they were, you know, some of them had good amount of stuff. They had to get rid of it. And in one very telling scene in the, uh, the movie Farewell to Manzanar, the mother threw her dishes on the ground because these people were coming to buy it 10 cents on a dollar or probably even less, basically giving it away. And she said, I'd rather break them than give it away for that cheap. I mean, these were her possessions. So what you see is what they could carry. They tried to carry as much as they could. I mean, you can imagine a, a little baby going along. They had to have formula, milk, whatever they could, they, that was needed. But you know, you were limited. So it was a very stressful time from the get-go when they had to get ready to go. And then they were sent to places like Tanforan. Tanforan was a racetrack. There were no people living there at that time. They moved the horses out. I don't know where the horses went. But the people were put into stalls, horse stalls, which were quickly cleaned up, whitewashed maybe. But they said it still smelled like manure and urine. But a family would have to take a stall and live there. And they lived for, there for about six months before the installations were being built, as they were being built. So it took, took a while. You know, there's, the order comes out. I guess this is the way the government does that. The order comes out, you got to do this. Then you got to build or gather your stuff to make that happen. So it took a while. So they were living in places like Santa Anita Racetrack, Tanforan Racetrack, and other places, basically in tents, or if, if it was a structure, it was a horse stall. So we have some images. Um, a lot of these, were, like I said, were from Dorothea Lang. Right? Um, one of the things that's interesting um, to know, if you do a comparative study of Dorothea Lang versus like Ansel Adams photographs, Dorothea Lang's photographs, at least in my opinion, and several other people's opinions, tend to be like a lot raw. Um, there's a lot, there's, they're not composed shots. Um, and you can see a lot of emotion on people's faces. So this famous one uh, from Hayward, California, uh, these are the two uh, Mochita girls. Um, and with their, they're with their parents, and they're waiting evacuation. Uh, notice, and, and this is the actual caption, the WRA caption. The youngster on the right holds a sandwich given her by one of a group of women who were present from a local church. So one of the things, there were two allies that uh, the Nikkei had. Um, there were only two, um, two major organizations. Uh, so one was the American Friends Service Society, which is the Quakers, and the West Coast ACLU. Not the Midwest or even Eastern ACLU. It was basically just the West Coast ACLU. Yeah. I just <clears throat> one, one point, not to uh, infuse any, any bias in this, but wouldn't you say that a female photographer would see more of the emotional and the, that kind of an impact on the family as opposed to perhaps the male like Ansel Adams? Possibly. Not, not to be biased. <laughs> <laughs> Possibly not to be biased. Um, and I, and I th another point was that, from what I read, that Ansel Adams did his job. He followed the orders and he took pictures. Oh, typical. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but well, okay. So my, I have a little bit of knowledge about this. So my understanding is, and we have a couple of photos by Ansel Adams. So Ansel Adams, apparently, his philosophy of photography, especially at least in regard to the camps, was that he wanted to present uh, Nikkei as, as being loyal. So he tended to take shots that made them look happy in camps, right? Um, a lot of these other photos by Dorothea Lange, you know, incarcerates look scared or they look downtrodden, right? And you, as you can imagine. So there is an interesting contrast. If you take a look at the art of the camps, it's actually quite interesting kind of a, a part of uh, this investigation here. So I'll just go through a couple more images a little more quickly. Uh, so we have children um, at the Turlock, California Assembly Center. 
So these are all the heartbreaking photos, right? If you go through Dorothea Lange's collection, and they're actually available from the National Archives and Records Administration. Um, this famous one. So Jerry, you actually want to talk, you know a little bit about this. You've met the daughter. Yeah. Um, so Shizuko Ina is this woman. Her daughter is a very prominent vocal person, Satsuko Ina. And she never knew this picture existed. She came upon it accidentally? Yeah, at the Smithsonian. She just went there one day and saw this image. And it said it didn't name who the, the, the woman was. She goes, that's my mother. Yeah. So this is Dorothea Lang, for those that don't know. Um, so she would, quite an interesting person. And, the, and her, her, her style of photography is quite interesting. So she would actually get up on top of her car frequently and, and take photographs. Um, but some of you might be more familiar with this image, right? This is uh, the famous uh, face of the Dust Bowl and the Great Depression migrant mother, right, from March 1st, 1936. This is actually explains the relationship that uh, Dorothea Lange had and why she was commissioned by the WRA to take photographs, because she already had a relationship with the federal government, right? So actually getting on board with them because they knew of her work and it was quite good, they just asked her if she would continue to take photographs but hear about the incarceration. One of the things that's not clear, but it's suspected, is that, well, why take all these photographs? Why document something like this about the incarceration? And it was thought that, well, they wanted to have some kind of, the WRA wanted to have evidence that they were not um, abusing the incarcerees, right? Um, some kind of evidence to that fact. So the, the, apparently, the, the photographs are supposed to be that evidence. OK, so Jerry, you're up. So that's my father. This is something he had to, well, you heard about it in Germany. You have to carry, the Jewish people had to carry documents with them. And of course, the slaves, if they were freed slaves or, or free slaves, free black people, they had to carry papers that said they were legally free. Well, my father had to carry his documents. Uh, I like this picture because he's got a Hitler mustache. <laughs> and we teased him a lot about this. And we never found out why he had that mustache. Not all his entire life, just this period. And that's, that's the horse stall. I mean, that's not a pleasant place to live, even for a horse. Yeah, and there were frequent anecdotes about people could still smell the horses and the horse manure uh, in and the stalls. It, it dawned on me <clears throat> that you know, the, the horses do their business right there. So where did the people do their business? Did they quickly build latrines? You know, like, it wasn't, it wasn't fun. You know, and these were honorable people. They were Americans, many of them. Uh, note, too, this is by Dorothea Lange. And note how at the bottom it says impounded. Oh, yeah. So a number of her photos, she, she had more or less free license to take photographs of what she wanted, um, except in very sensitive places. Um, but uh, the WRA had control of what images or what photographs actually got published. So some photographs, even though they were taken, they were not destroyed, but they were just not, they were impounded. So <laughs> that's what you see some, you know, either on the front or sometimes on the back, it'll just say impounded. Um, uh, yeah, I have a book that says impounded, but I thought it meant yeah, it's, people. It's, yeah, this book, yeah. Yeah. Right. So I this is the was, photos of you know, Dorothy We were Lane. impounded. No, but no, actually these photographs that she took were impounded. That, that's what she meant. That's of uh, San Bruno. Oh, Tanperan, you know. yeah. Yeah. So yeah. one thing to note, the reason why we have another image of the Tanperan Assembly Center is that you know, it would frequently get pretty muddy, and, you know, and then it would become just a mess. And so people would have to put planks to just get across um, just outside of their, um, their apartments, is what they call them. Right? <laughs> One thing about, I want to point is that, so this is Arkansas. Jerome is where I was conceived, but that's another story. <laughs> <laughs> Roar is just next to it. And these are way far away from the exclusion zone. And also nearby, just off of this map, is Mississippi, which comes into play later on when the 442nd is training. 
this is the, the National Park Service map. Do anybody notice anything that's missing from this map? Well, Hawaii, right? I mean, oh, Hawaii's yeah. not miss is missing from this map, right? So, um, so it's incomplete. We know that Honolulu, which is only about five miles from us, right, was the biggest of the camps. Though it was also a mix of a POW camp as well. Can I, can I interject? Yeah. So when the play, Broadway play Allegiance was making its rounds, it was playing in San Diego. This is before it got to Broadway. And uh, George Takei, was the big star, and they had a Q&A afterwards. And so he, he was up there on stage with the, the uh, other actors, and he said, well, you know, the war starts in Hawaii, but the people in Hawaii were not incarcerated. And I'm kind of looking around because nobody was saying anything. And I don't know what drove me, but I, I didn't know what to say, but I said, error, error. <laughs> I didn't know what else to say, right? But I felt I had to speak up for the people of Hawaii. I said, no, we were incarcerated. Not in the numbers, not all the people, but we were, you know, we were rounded up too. So I corrected George Takei. <laughs> uh, so we have an image here of the Topaz concentration camp. So there, you know, frequently these camps were set up in uh, very arid places, isolated places, um, in places basically you would not want to live, right? Uh, even if you could develop the area, you wouldn't want to live there. Uh, Manzanar, for example, it, that whole Owens Valley is a wind tunnel um, and it's become worse over the years. You may have seen a documentary called uh, Manzanar um, well. Diverted. Uh, so it's a, and basically about how different groups of um, Japanese Americans uh, have aligned uh, interests with um, the Owens Valley Paiute, so the indigenous people of the area, to try to, because the Owens Valley is the source of LA's water. It's like a big straw. The aqueduct goes from Owens Valley all the way down to LA, and it's sucking up all the water. There's nothing left, and the lake bed, what, what used to be Owens Lake, has sh uh, shrunk dramatically. And now what's happening is that all the dust, because there's nothing left to keep it in place, is being kicked up when the, when the, the fierce winds get going, and is blowing all that dust into, um, you know, and it's being inhaled by people. Yeah. So I was in Washington, D.C. for American Dental Association convention, and they had a gala night at the Smithsonian, the American History Museum in Smithsonian. So it was you know, really fun. It was food and drink on every floor. We were you know, allowed to wander wherever we wanted to go. And so eventually, my wife and I, we found ourselves on the uppermost floor. And I walked into this room. And the first thing I see is this guard tower. But I immediately knew what that meant. This is going to be a display about the Japanese and Japanese Americans. And so you know, we started looking around. There was something on the 442. And then I went to another section of the wall. They had these little postcard-sized paintings of a sandstorm. So I was telling Betsy that, oh, yeah, this is where my, my parents talked about this. You know, the wind would come, the sand would come, they'd blow all over the place, they'd clean up like good Japanese people, they'd clean their house, and then another one would come. It was constant. And the man next to me said, oh, I heard about these. And he was Caucasian, he was Howley. So I said, oh, how did you hear about it? He said, well, I had a lot, I'm from LA, I have a lot of you know, Japanese American friends, and when they came back, they talked about this. I said, oh, that's interesting. And then, this guy walks up next to me, and I call him ethnic for lack of a better word, because he was shorter than me, swarthier guy, meaning that I thought he would know better. But he said, none of this stuff happened. This is all made up. I said, well, what do you mean? He said, yeah, this is, this is all fake. I said, hey, I was born there. It's not fake. He said, oh, no, no, no. You probably had to go because your parents, well, my sister's because your parents were put in. And my father was Japanese from, you know, Japanese national. <clears throat> I said, I know of young men who volunteered out of the camps to fight the war. So they were of age. And I was getting so mad that I had to walk away because I could see the headlines in the Washington Post or something. <laughs> Two dentists duke it out. <laughs> because, <laughs> but I never thought I would encounter 
you know, so what many, the deniers. I never thought I'd personally get that way, but this happens. Yeah, so we have an image here of, uh, there's two um, photographs, and they're, they're very similar, but they, they contrast slightly. So this is from another one from Dorothea Lange, July 3rd, 1942, so right before uh, 4th of July. Um, it's not as composed, and the, the image isn't all that great. There's, it looks like there's like either scratches or, you know, like a hair on the negative. Um, but you can see the dust that's being kicked up in these two individuals here look like they're trying to run away from the, the, the dust storm. Um, and that would be pretty, that's, that's pretty common for Manzanar. Um, but notice, this is the, the one that gets published all the time. <laughs> this is the cleaned up version. <laughs> and this is, notice what the, the caption says, which is that this is after the windstorm has subsided. Right? So it's kind of like, what public face do you want to put on to the camps? Right? And that's what, that was one of the concerns um, during the incarceration. Um, also note, too, so you know, if you think about the camps, there wasn't a lot of privacy. These are basically military-style barracks, right? Which means they also had military-style restrooms and bathrooms, right, and washrooms. So there were no partitions um, for, the, for the toilets. So there are a lot of accounts of like people, um, especially women, uh, going in. Or you know, if you had some cardboard, that was a luxury because then you can make a little partition for yourself if you could, around there. In one case, one sad case, there was a, a, an anecdote I heard about a woman who would just put a bag over her head so that she, you can identify her. Yeah. Or they would wait till late at night yeah. so nobody else was there. Which and would cause all kinds of GI problems. Yes, later. and some, an older woman told me that she told us in a tour once that she wet her bed because she was too afraid to go out. And so every, every morning she'd have to wash her sheets, hang them up to dry. But, you know. Yeah, same thing with the showers, right? This, mm -hmm. you know, well, this is like what well, some of may have seen in high school, <laughs> right, anyway. Um, OK, so one thing, too, and Jerry can share a little bit more about this. So even though they were very spare conditions, though, they, you know, Nikkei kind of tricked out their places. Um, this is actually not that tricked out, but you should see some of the other photos. But some of those are just not in the public domain, so I can't use them. I have to be very careful about which images I included today. Um, but they would make shelves, uh, they would make tables out of scrap lumber. Um, so they would make homes out of these places at some point. Oh, yeah. And so this is uh, from Ansel Adams. So finally getting into Ansel Adams. So, Ansel Adams, again, so he tried to play up the loyalty of the Nikkei, right? So it's kind of an irony in a way that uh, the incarcerees here are playing nat uh, America's national pastime in an incarceration camp. So this was taken in 1943. The, the camp rules became looser over time, more relaxed. Um, later, so basically in the early days, so 1942, 1943, um, in 43 is when uh, Dorothea Lange and Ansel Adams came in. D Dorothea Lange came first, and then An Ansel Adams came later. One of the things to note about what Dorothea Lange had noted about her experience of uh, taking photographs of the camps is that she felt like it was one of the toughest jobs she ever had, uh, not just physically, though it was physically demanding, but also because she said at one point that this was, she was like watching the, the Constitution erode before her very eyes. And incidentally, the, in Tule Lake anyway, the guy who set up the baseball field was originally from Hawaii. I think he had moved to the mainland, but he scrounged around, got irrigation equipment, made the baseball field, you know, organized the league. So we do have a connection to this. So they started to make lives for themselves in the camps. Uh, to head all kinds of different, uh, once they develop schools, even kind of dressmaking classes. Um, and then, I think you were going to share some... Uh, yeah, that's Tule Lake. They call this Castle Mountain. There's another mountain that they call Abalone Mountain because it looks like an abalone, kind of upside down, I guess. And, and there was another place in Shasta called, they called Mount Fuji because it kind of looked... <laughs> Like Mount Fuji. So they were always, you know, getting getting into these kinds of things. Um, but I wanted to show you, and if you have time, to look at this book or to get a copy of this book. 
because it's, he talked, Michael talked about the, how they dress things up in their little barracks. They made all kinds of art too, but they also made platforms, little tables, chairs, seats, and also in this one I was able to find quickly baskets. So these people worked hard all, all their lives in their knees. You know, they had a business or they had a farm. They worked from you know, dawn to dusk. When they went to the camps, suddenly they had nothing to do. They were free, so to speak, to do whatever they wanted to do, aside from some chores, but the artistic side of them came out. And wonderful, beautiful stuff that they, they just kind of put together with whatever was lying around. My mother had had a jar. It was a mayonnaise jar, upside down. The base of it, the, the screw part, was the base, and she had uh, pipe cleaners. She molded it into dolls, and she put shelves all along it. So, and the glass part was the case. And we kept these for a long, long time. So these people, for the first time in their lives, had time to do something artistic. And they, they did. They made birds. They made rings out of dental products, toothbrushes. They would mold it. I don't know how they did it, but they would mold it and make I mean, it looked like it was jewelry. And the birds were anatomically correct. It was just wonderful. This is, you. this is a letter that my father, it's actually this way, my father sent to my mother. My father is now in New Mexico, but there's another story to that. But my wife can tell me to not <laughs> talk too long. It was written to my mother. First thing to say, see is, my mother doesn't have a Y in her name. She was, oh, she doesn't. Oyobu is her Japanese, her legal name. And she was given the name Elaine because the teachers couldn't pronounce Oyobu. And she was a Nisei, by the way. So she was in Tule Lake where I was born. But my mother, my father sent this letter to my mother and we used to laugh at that because it's all cut up. He thought, ah, oh, you're a spy. You know, you had secrets in here you were telling them. So that's why they cut it up. Well, we never knew what this, and the letter in entirety said, because we couldn't read Japanese, but it looked funny. And the University of Hawaii had a program, um, and they they took some of my father's stuff, and they, <laughs> they translated this this letter. And what's interesting about it, not so much the content, because it really had nothing. He talked about the weather and somebody being born and stuff. But up there it says, enemy alien male. And in the translation, I forget where it went, but the translation was dated October, not the translation. The letter was sent to my mother, October 1945. The war ended in August of 1945. So why is he, but they still considered the enemy? Because there was no war. What secrets did my father, would he have had after being incarcerated for at least three plus years that he wanted to tell my mother about. And, you know, like they're still cutting up your letters to, you know, to a family member. I, I thought that was very strange. Oh, and that's me over there. That's my mother. And that's my sister who was born in September 41. But I wanted you to see this picture the barracks that we lived in. I don't know exactly where it was, but since I was born December 20, 1944, I must be about a year and close a year and a half. It must be about the time that we were getting ready to go back. And so we're, I think that must be it because we're all dressed up. I don't think we dress like this all the time, you know, with a nice suit looking thing. But the, the house, houses we had, the barracks we had, were not made out of wood. They had wood frames, but there were wall, the walls were made out of tar paper. And underneath was open space. So like in, particularly in Arkansas, my mother used to always worry about snakes. Because the people in Hawaii didn't know how to handle snakes. Another thing about that was that 
the group from Hawaii, which were mainly wives and families, because the husbands were already taken away, they were promised by the government that they could join their husbands. So they voluntarily went to the camps. They didn't have to go, and some didn't. But when they got there, the husband's not there. He's over there in New Mexico in the, oh, another distinction, Department of Justice camps. These are Department of Interior camps. So these are two separate, most of the people were Department of Interior, about 110,000 or something. But the others were Department of Justice. The FBI had arrested them. So they were told they could join their husband. Eventually, obviously, my father did join my mother. But we had to contend. So my mother arrived. That was my point. That was going to be my mother arrived on January third, I think, in 1943, in Jerome, Arkansas, and it was pretty darn cold. And the people from Hawaii didn't know how to behave in cold weather. They didn't have the clothing. They didn't know how to, you know, what to wear. And the Kotonks, according to that term, gave them what they had what little that they had, their warm clothing, and you know how to behave in this kind of weather, how to light a pot belly stove, etc., etc. So the Hawaii people you know, were fish out of water for a while. OK, so um, getting to Hawaii now. So the US government would uh, ultimately incarcerate 2,270 uh, Nikkei from Hawaii, uh, as indicated in the accompanying map, which I'm going to show you in a second. Uh, so there, there were several detention facilities scattered throughout the archipelago, um, and some of them were just merely jails. Like in Maui, the, the incarceration or detention site was the Maui County Jail. Um, and of course, Honolulu, which is relevant for us here at the Pu'uloa campus of Leeward Community College, so uh, it was 160 acres of arid land west of Waipahu. Um, it became the largest prison of war camp in Hawaii by March 1943, holding approximately 320 internees and 4,000 individuals. I've never been uh, clear about why it is that what was the calculus or criteria for um, civilians being incarcerated at Honolulu, um, and why not ship them to the you know, continental US? I'm not clear about that. If anybody knows, like, pipe up. Um, so for Honolulu, it was listed on the National Register of Historic Places in 2012 and was designated a uh, national monument by President Bar uh, Barack Obama in 2015 and rededicated as a national historic site in 2019. So this is a, a, a map from the National Park Service that details like all the detention sites uh, throughout the islands. You know. And the one that's still there is uh KMC, KMC, uh, Kilauea Military Camp, because it's got other functions. Yeah. And so this is one from Oahu, right? So different sites were used. So Sand Island, of course, detention site, the US Immigration Station, the HPD, um, Honolulu Military Police Station. So this is an image of the Sand Island concentration camp that's under construction in February 13th in 1942. So some of them initially were just like tents, right? Everything was accounted for. In one story I read uh, from this journalist who wrote a book about it was that a spoon was missing. And so everybody had to go outside of their tent, stand in their wreaths, while they inspected their, their tents. For like hours they were outside. And finally, they found the spoon just misplaced. So they were under constant surveillance. Yeah, so this is an image of Honolulu. Uli. Um, so kind of looking north. So you can see the tents along this way here. So there were tents and there were also barracks. Uh, my understanding is that the POWs were frequently in the tents, but not exclusively so. So Jerry's got this. Um, he's going to be talking about the different types of responses uh, to the incarceration. So starting off with uh, two kind of like concepts. So Gaman and Shikata. Jerry one? Yeah, like the name of this book, The Art of Gaman. Gaman is basically you endure it. You, you 
you hold back your true feelings, of course, that's what he means, but you keep yourself together. Be steady about it. And shigata ganai is, you can't help it anyway. So these are the two concepts that kept the people going. You know, don't complain is another thought that's hidden in there, but don't complain, follow the rules, which is typical Asian, I guess, but gamang and shikata ganai is still used today. That's a I'd like to add to that, if I may. Uh, my grandmother always said that, you know, shikatiganai. But I think the best definition that I've heard of it is to accept with grace what you cannot change. Rather than accept and groan about it and moan about it and complain about it, accept with grace what you cannot change and move on. And so after the war, the Japanese accepted what happened to them with grace and moved on. Yeah. So they never talked about their experience during World War II. That was behind them. They've already done that. And so that's why today we wonder why didn't they talk about it? Shikaku yeah. Okay, so. Yeah, so this is the 442. They were at Iolani Palace getting ready to go to the troop ships, which took them then for training. I guess these are the officers. A lot of the core of the 442 came from the University of Hawaii, the ROTC program. They were kicked out at some point, like early on, and they they were in despair because they knew they were not going to be disloyal. Um, Hang Wu Ching. Yeah, Hang Wai or Hang Wu? Hang Wai. Hang Wai Ching was the head of, head of the uh, YMCA, gave them the courage they needed. He said, you guys can complain about it. You can mope around and, and make fools out of yourselves. Or you can show them that you're still loyal. You can go help, dig ditches, break rocks, do whatever you can. Whatever they ask you to do, you do. So, when, so they went up to Schofield, among other places, and they did, did that kind of stuff. And then they were called up. These 442nd, it's it's kind of long long story short is that they were volunteers. The hundred infantry were guys already in the military service, so therefore they were older. They were either draftees, um, national guard, who were being activated. But the government didn't know what to do because all of a sudden they were uniformed, but they were not wanted. So they put them together as a hundred infantry and sent them, trained them, and then sent them to Europe. So the four forty second volunteers who followed them. And then when the 100th infantry was decimated, you know, so many of them were hurt and killed, they then merged them together. So, they're, But they're all Japanese Americans, they're all citizens. MIF, who is the MIF? Anybody know? You know why you don't know? Because it was top secret for 50 years. These poor guys were not able to tell their family that they were serving in the war. And for 50 years thereafter, they went to the Pacific. They were the interrogators, the interpreters, the translators, because these guys excelled in the Japanese language. A lot of people spoke Japanese, but these guys were good at it. A big bolster to this group were called the Kibe, who were American by citizenship, but were educated in Japan. These people, the Kibe, knew the nuances of the language, of the habits, of the particulars of the Japanese people. So oftentimes they would team up the Japanese American with the Kibe Japanese American because they, they could get more out of them. And there's so many stories which these guys could not tell till recently. They started training in San Francisco, and then it looked funny that they had Japanese in the neighborhood, so they had to go to Minnesota, I think. Anyway, they were, they were trained elsewhere eventually. Yeah, so maybe just to add to that, so um, Major General Charles Willoughby, so that was General MacArthur's chief of intelligence, claimed that the work of the Nisei linguists saved over a million lives um, and brought the war to an end two years earlier than it might have otherwise. You guys heard of uh, Merrill's Marauders? who fought in Burma. 
the TV and the, the TV. The MIS were with it. And they, they, they had a lot of work to do. OK, so uh, Nikkei responses to the incarceration also took the form of dissent. So in 1943, the War Department and War Relocation Authority, so the WRA, I'm just going to abbreviate, devised a means of assessing the loyalty of Nikkei uh, in the concentration camps. All adults were asked to answer questions on a form titled Application for Leave Clearance, but which uh, became informally known as the Loyalty Questionnaire. So responses to this questionnaire were meant to aid the War Department in recruiting Nisei into an all Nisei combat unit and to assist the WRA in authorizing others for relocation and leave outside of the camps. So two questions in particular raised concerns among Nikkei, and so you can see them here, questions 27 and 28. So question number 27 asked, asked if Nisei men were willing to serve on combat duty wherever ordered and asked if any, uh, everyone else if they would be willing to serve in other ways, such as serving in the Women's Army Auxiliary Corps. Question number 28 asked if individuals would swear unqualified allegiance to the United States and forswear any form of allegiance to the Emperor of Japan. So that's problematic, right? So both questions caused a great deal of concern and unrest. So citizens resented being asked to renounce loyalty to the Emperor of Japan when they had never had any loyalty to the Emperor. Japanese immigrants were barred from becoming US citizens on the basis of race. So renouncing their only citizenship would be problematic because it would leave them stateless. So young men worry that declaring the willingness to serve in combat units of the army would be akin to volunteering. So it, was, it felt like a trap for a number of uh, individuals. Um, so the number of young men who answered no to questions number 27 and 28 shock camp administrators. So about 12,000 out of the 78,000 people over the age of 17 whom the questionnaire was distributed to either refused to answer, gave qualified answers, or answered negatively. So the young men who responded to uh, questions 27 and 28, uh, responded no, excuse me, to questions 27 and 28 on the questionnaire, came to be called the no-no boys. So many of these no-no boys were inaccurately and unfairly labeled draft resistors. And uh, many of them were sent to the Thule Lake concentration camp, uh, which developed a reputation as the camp for troublemakers or disloyals. So that's where Jerry's. Yeah, but that, that, that camp, well, first of all, 27. Would you, if you were in, in prison by the U.S. government, would you go fight for the country that imprisoned you? And they also asked, will you let my parents go? Could they, could they leave the camp? The answer was no. So would you really do it? You know, and I, I thought long and hard about it because the Vietnam War was going on hot and heavy when, when I was eligible. <laughs> so I had to think about that. And 28 is kind of a, you know, this, we were, oh, my parents were no, no. They said no. My father, I could understand. But the thing is, other, the other side of the question, my father was from Japan. He had a mother and two sisters. He had also two brothers who I'm pretty sure he felt like they were, they were going to die in the war. So, okay, so they're ministers. And in Japan, it's like a family business. You own the church. We owned our church for like almost a thousand years. So his brothers are killed, probably. He wanted to go back. This is how I think he felt. He wanted to go back because he had to be the head of the church. He had a mother and two sisters. He wanted to be able to take care of them. So he had other thoughts besides being disloyal, did, did not forswear allegiance to the emperor. It was, you know, purely economical, too. So it wasn't just one pat answer. And when I was in Chicago in dental school, I met a lot of families who were Japanese Americans, and they all were interned. And when they found out that I was born in Tule Lake, you know what their response was? Oh. What that meant was, you were one of the disloyal ones. <laughs> you were no good, because <laughs> these people were loyal Americans. Well, it wasn't, it wasn't that you know, cut and dry. You were not disloyal, but you were fed up. 
Okay, so another response to the incarceration was resistance. So as exemplified by members of the Heart Mountain Fair Play Committees, or FPC. So the FPC was comprised of draft age uh, Nisei men at the Heart Mountain, Wyoming concentration camp. So members of the FPC advocated for a restoration of Nisei civil rights as a precondition for compliance with the military draft. And they counseled non-compliance with the draft in order to create a test case of the lawfulness of conscripting the incarcerated Nisei. So they basically, to sum up, they, would, they were willing to serve on condition that their families were let out of the camps and everybody else, by the way. So in June 1944, 63 members of the FPC were arrested and convicted for failure to report for military service. And all 63 were sentenced to three years of jail time, which the younger defendants served at the McNeil Island Federal Penitentiary near Tacoma, Washington. And the older served at the Leavenworth Federal Pen Penitentiary in Kansas. So in December 1947, President Harry Truman granted a full pardon to the 63 convicted members of the FPC, as well as to the draft resistors from the other camps. So one of the most famous ones is on the right, Frank Emmy. So they rounded up Frank Emmy. Um, Frank Emmy was like a sensei of judo, um, but he had a particular, you know, he was he's one of the kind of well-known faces of the FPC. So uh, he went to um, uh, the uh, McNeil Island Federal Penitentiary. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the constitutionality of the camps. So what, in fact, ended uh, the camps? So frequently cited are uh, the cases of um, you know, Fred Korematsu, Gordon Hirabayashi, and uh, Min Yasui. But actually it was a woman, so Sharon, who ended the camps in her court case. So uh, it, it was ex parte Mitsuye Endo, who I have pictured here. So unlike the attorneys for the notable plaintiffs, um, Fred Korematsu, Gordon Hirabayashi, and Min Yasui, who challenged the curfew and relocation orders of the military, Endo's legal team pressed the issue of habeas corpus, or evidence of wrongdoing. So initially, Endo did not want to go through with the case. Uh, her ACLU attorneys, however, felt that she was the ideal candidate, so she, they had to persuade her to uh, pursue the case. She was an American citizen. She had, a, she had held a stable job as a secretary at the Sacramento DMV before the war, and her brother was serving in the military. So additionally, Endo agreed not to drop her case to uh, take a deal from the federal government in order to ensure that all Nikkei would re be released from the incarceration. So the, her, her legal team had warned her that it would be possible that the, the government would try to cut a deal that to let her and her family out of the camps if they would move east, but not to return to the west coast, um, and just her and her family. But she said, no, you got to let everybody out. Uh, Endo's lawyers, um, in 1944, the Supreme Court uh, ruled that the federal government could not confine indefinitely U.S. citizens of Japanese ancestry who were conceitedly loyal in concentration camps. So you had to have proof of wrongdoing. That's what habeas corpus is, right? So news of the Supreme Court's ruling led the U.S. Department with the consent of FDR to announce the lifting of Jap uh, the Japanese American exclusion from the West Coast uh, and thereby made possible the winding down of the camps. So that's actually the court case that ended it. So you're going to be talking about the return home. Yeah. yeah. So the Hawaii people were finally let out of the camp in 46. Other people had left earlier. Matter of fact, starting in late 43, they let people go if they would go east. They couldn't go back to the exclusion zone. But, you know, young couples. They wanted to move on with their lives. So I met many people in Denver and St. Louis, Chicago, I know Detroit, because the industry needed labor. And there were a contingent of people who went out to New Jersey because Birdseye, the one company, needed farmers. So they were allowed to leave earlier. But people started to leave, especially as the war was turning towards our favor. My mother, my father was taken away. So well, obviously he was there an important time when I was conceived, but in 44, uh, in July of 44, they were taken to Hulile because they had answered no, no. And so we were now going to be sent, they, I wasn't wrong, they were going to be sent to Japan. 
repatriated, they call it. And so these people were actually sent. But my mother said, no, I'm not going to go back to Japan. She said to my father, through telegrams, we're going to go back to Hawaii. My father, now in New Mexico, said, okay, we can go back to Hawaii. If they hadn't done that, if we had gone back to Japan, I wouldn't be here today. I would be a tourist somewhere out there <laughs> with a camera or two. Um, but my father's, my mother's decision was really strong for a Japanese American woman, or any Japanese woman, because it would have been tantamount to divorce. If she had said to you, you go home, I'm going back to Hawaii. And my father said, okay. So because of that, my mother, thank you, I'm an American, I'm here. But I was only given, when I was born, a Japanese name. So my legal name is Satoru, because we were going to be sent back to Japan. When we came back to Hawaii, I tacked on Gerald, which became Jerry. So that's my little history. I haven't made it legal because I decided I wanted to keep the history of my name the way it is. But anyway, so in 1945, January, my father was asked to give a speech to the dissident group called the Hoshidan in Bulele, give them a speech. And he said, no, I can't give you a speech because I don't believe, this is what I think he said, this, I believe I don't believe in your cause. You're Americans. You have to be loyal to your country. I'm Japanese. I can be loyal to my country. But as a Buddhist minister, I can give you a sermon. I, I'm okay with that. So he gave them a sermon. And the next morning, he was arrested, taken away. There's a stockade that they built in Tule Lake, a prison within a prison, high security. And he was there for a while, and then he was sent this time to New Me uh, Santa Fe, New Mexico. So that's where he wound up. So again, my parents were separated. And I struggled with that because I said, when, when I didn't know the details, was that, are we back to the days of slavery when they can take a child and sell them to uh, somebody else and take a, husband, a father off here and a mother off there? Are we, still, are we still living in those days? But then I found out almost by luck that that was the story. And they separated him because now he was considered dangerous again. So he was sent back to the Department of Justice camp in New Mexico. So my mother and the rest of the Hawaii contingent were taken to temporary housing somewhere in California, Burbank, California. I heard about the trailer camps in Tacna, uh, Lomita. And they, were, they lived there in trailers, kind of like those, for a while. I, I don't know the period, how long. And then they were taken to the docks, like Long Beach, and put on troop ships, the very bottom, because there were other people, and other higher priority people in there, sent back to Hawaii. Except, when my mother went up, they didn't have her on a manifest. She was not on their list. And she had two little kids. I think we were given $25 each. Was that the amount? And, and a ticket to, to go wherever they were, want, wanted to go. Well, she didn't know what to do. My father wasn't there to help. You know, she spoke the language, obviously, but she had no means. Well, fortunately, this is all stories. My mother embellished. Um, <laughs> fortunately, a social worker, a woman said she was a social worker, came up to her and said, I'm assigned to take care of you until you get put on the, on the ship. So, they were taken, oh, I was there then. I was taken, we were all taken to San Francisco, put in a hotel or a mo probably a motel, and every day this woman would come by, take us sightseeing in San Francisco. So I saw the Golden Gate Bridge when I was a year and a half. And she would you know, take them to lunch, take them to dinner, and then bring them back to their place for a whole week this way. And then we were put on a ship to come back to Hawaii. But this time, it wasn't a troop, troop ship. It was a SS, USS? Anyway, it was the um, 
Betsy Hall. No, not the Lurleen. Matsoni. No, Mariposa. Mariposa. The Mariposa. She went first class. Wow. My mother was lucky in many ways. She went home first class, and she said the soldiers would come up and take us and, you know, take care of us. And, you know, these are soldiers who had just been in the Pacific fighting, you know, the same face, right? And so we were treated first class, and so when I, I guess she sent out word to her friends she was coming home, because they were really sad when she couldn't get on a troop ship. They were all there to meet her at the docks, and she saw this first class ship coming with the mother, you know, probably <laughs> gained a few pounds, and kids all happy, and they were mad at her. <laughs> but that's another story. <laughs> okay, so um, there's some important information I want to make sure to touch on. So. Uh, you know, upon the return to the West Coast, so many Nikkei were subjected to violence, harassment, and discrimination, uh, as racial resentment still rode high. Many who still owned homes and property returned to find those things looted, vandalized, or destroyed. A select few who had entrusted their property to principled individuals found their belongings intact and in good condition. Right? Uh, many Nikkei were financially ruined by the incarceration, particularly by the forced fire sale preceding it. Economic losses were estimated at 400 million shortly after the war. Adjusted for 2003 economic conditions, losses have been estimated at 4.7 billion. So today, that obviously, that amount is going to be much higher than that. Can I point out that you know I, ne I never thought about this, but those poor people who were let out of the camps, they had nothing to go back to. Many of them. I mean, if they had a business, you can be sure the clientele had moved on. If they had a farm. Many of them came back to a farm that had been looted. All their farm equipment was gone. And so, you know, the Hawaii Japanese were actually lucky in the sense that we had family still here. So if you had a business, hopefully your brother, brother-in-law, somebody else in the family could take, take care of the business and keep it going. I never thought about how much the Katonks suffered because after the war was over, they were still suffering. And this went on for years. You know, they, they lived in churches, assembly halls, you know, little places that they could find through the grace of other people. That's how they survived until they could make a living. So it was tough times. Okay, so I'm gonna kind of jam through the rest. So uh, the Civil Liberties Act of 1988. So in 1980, uh, Congress established the Commission on Wartime Relocation and Internment of Civilians to identify the causes of and to make amends for the Nikkei incarceration. So the Commission determined that the incarceration of Nikkei was a violation of citizens' constitutional rights to due process in habeas corpus. In its conclusion, the Commission identified three broad reasons for the incarceration, which I kind of touched on earlier at the beginning of the presentation. So race prejudice, war hysteria, and a failure of political leadership. But I would add, because we've been talking about it, greed, too. Um, so one of the tangible outcomes of the commission was the passage of the Civil Liberties Act of 1988, uh, which President Reagan signed into law on August 10th of that year. So this is that image. Um, and we have some actually Hawaii legislators in there too. Uh, Spark Matsunaga, Pat Psyche, right? See, Norman Mineta is there. He's not but from California, right? Uh, this federal act granted redress of $20,000 and a formal presidential apology to every surviving US citizen or legal resident immigrant of Japanese ancestry Incar incarcerated during World War II. I think one of the kind of interesting lessons, like what, what can we learn from all of this? So actually for Earl Warren, um, you know, who was Attorney General of California and then eventually became governor, um, initially he was a vehement advocate for the Nikkei incarceration when he was serving as Attorney General and then governor. But he, you know, later he became the 14th Chief Justice of the US Supreme Court from 1953 to 1969. Uh, in his posthumously uh, published memoir, Warren regretted his role in the Nikkei incarceration. Um, in fact, there's a kind of anecdote about him getting choked up during an interview where he felt like he had to leave once the interviewer asked him about his role in the incarceration. He had to break away. He was so broken up that he had to stop the interview, and then he came back and then you know, composed himself and then continued with the interview. Uh, he noted that he regretted uh, his role in the incarceration. And in his book, uh, Infamy, the Shocking Story of the Japanese Internment in World War II, journalist Richard Reeves claims that Warren's role in the incarceration led him to rule in favor of the plaintiffs in Brown v. Board of Education of Topeka, Kansas. 
1954, and several other important civil rights cases that came before the U.S. Supreme Court. So hopefully um, that seemed to have made an impact on him and his, his rulings going forward. So that's Chief Justice Warren. Okay, so I'm going to talk about quickly and kind of wrap this up because uh, I know that we're a little bit over time. Um, what's the relevance of all of this, the Nikkei incarceration? So, you know, a couple things, and I think we can maybe have a little bit of discussion, but there's been an alarming rate, a rise in anti-Asian hate crimes uh, and hate rhetoric across the United States. There's been a kind of attacks on our constitutional rights. There have been continuing racial profiling continued violations of rights to due process and habeas corpus. I think racial profiling is a kind of attack on due process and habeas corpus. Family separation conducted at our southern border of the continental US. Failure of political leadership. Um, you know, we've had a promotion of violent insurrection um, against our own uh, government, challenges to free and fair elections, vocal support of hate groups. So one of the things I think that's particularly kind of nice to hear from Thomas Jefferson is that the price of liberty is eternal vigilance, that um, you know, democracy is not a one and done. It takes work and consistent work. Right? Also regarding uh, wartime hysteria, which is what the Congressional Commission identified as one of the causes of the incarceration. So after 9-11, Muslims, Middle Easterners, and South Asians surveilled, were surveilled, targeted, and profiled. Extra legal categories were invented to ensure national security during the Iraq War. So, for example, non, um, in, in, uh, during the war, you know, World War II, the term non alien was used pretty frequently instead of citizen because you wouldn't want to use the term citizen for people who you're locking up. Um, and, you know, uh, following the Iraq War, uh, enemy combatant was used rather than prisoner of war. Why would you want to use that term? because prisoners of war have rights under the Geneva Convention. There have been indefinite detentions like Guantanamo Bay detention camp, suspension of due process in habeas corpus that they've not been accused of and there's been no proof of wrongdoing. And I think also to the recognition of intersectionality, so the, the, the recognition of how our kind of fates are aligned in some ways. Uh, and need for mutual support and solidarity. Um, you know, several Japanese Americans came out in support of Muslims, Middle Easterners, and South Asians after 9-11. And now, in fact, I have an article here somewhere amongst my mess. Um, several Japanese American groups are now working with African American groups to strategize African American reparations. So that was in the paper about two weeks ago, in fact, but it's, that's been going on for a while. So one of the uh, Former presidents of the Japanese American Citizens League, John Tataishi, he's actually, he was involved with a lot of the legal cases. Um, he's actually advising a number of legal, African American legal groups and how, because they've done it before, how do you get reparations, right? Now, we have oversight and censorship of curricula and erasure of the past, which is relevant for us in higher education. Attack on critical race theory, Book bans, such as Julie Otsuka's When the Emperor Was Divine, which is banned in the Oswego, Norway, Wisconsin school district. And banning of curricula, such as the uh, AP African American Studies courses in Florida. Right, so I think we can make a number of different connections. Um, maybe just to wrap up, um, because I think it's easy to become very cynical about all of these uh, experiences. So I like this particular quote by uh, Marin Konishi. She gave, this is part of her valedictory address. If you read the entire speech, it's actually quite thoughtful and eloquent. Um, in fact, what she does in the closing, she lists a long litany of America's errors, uh, in, starting with um, the treatment of indigenous peoples through slavery and Jim Crow. And then she asks this question, can we, the graduating class of Amachi Senior High School, so this is in Colorado, uh, still believe that America means freedom, equality, security, and justice. Do I believe this? Do my classmates believe this? Yes, with all our hearts, because in that faith, in that hope, is my future, our future, and the world's future. So, you know, there has to be hope to, to change things for the better, right? And then, but I want to also leave us with uh, a quote by Michi Weglin, whose book, Years of Infamy, is actually one of the earliest um, comprehensive histories of the uh, incarceration camps. 
So I hope this uniquely American story will serve as a warning that they who say it can never happen again are probably wrong. So thank you, everybody, for coming. I'd like, I'd like to end on a high note, too. Um, first of all, uh, Pope 42, we, we are forever, and I mean 100th as well as the Pope 42, those guys. We're forever indebted to you because when we were under those conditions, they made us, it made it possible for us to hold our heads up. Because they proved without doubt that we were Americans, which is the whole premise of a, most of us being there, that we were not Americans, we were suspect. So we can't forget a lot of things. But we cannot forget what they did. So, so many of them are gone now. They're, you know, that age, they're dying off. So guys like me and the generations they follow, the sons and the young say, they have to know the story, they have to tell the story. But the high note I wanted to finish on is our daughter. So our daughter was graduating from Tufts University back in... 97. <laughs> she knows, I know. <laughs> she was... Uh, 99. She, she's an opera singer in San Francisco today. So she was asked at, in college to ask to sing the national anthem. So we're there, you know, we got there early to be front row seats. My mother had a picture of my father who had passed away by then. <clears throat> my daughter gets up to sing. And I'm like, I hope she doesn't screw up. <laughs> <laughs> father, right? <laughs> well, she sang beautiful. But then it dawned on me. I said to myself, you know, here I was. I was born in a prison because I was Japanese. Japanese. My daughter is up there, and she looks very Asian. She's singing, and I just had a feeling that there was no question about her nationality. She was American, whereas mine was question. So, so in one generation, we went from putting me in prison into my daughter getting up and singing nationally. I said, we're a great country. We have our faults, plenty of them, but we keep on correcting ourselves because we are not afraid to look at our faults and try to correct them. And so that is my idea. All right. Okay, well, thanks everybody for coming. I appreciate you all being here and being interested in this discussion. Thank you.